Okay. Okay, good afternoon and greeting to all the participants. My name is Amit Sharma and I am the chair of the training committee for IIA India Delhi branch. And I would like to thank, start by thanking everyone for taking out time for attending this webinar on the topic of Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023, Safeguarding Privacy in the Digital Era. And I actually, you know, uh, would want to appreciate everyone uh, who are attending despite an India-Pakistan cricket match going on. So that shows the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, knowledge that people want to learn on this topic. Now, just before we start, just a few hygiene points. Uh, again, if, if anyone has got any questions, if you can use the chat window uh, for posting those questions. And we will pick up those questions at an appropriate time. Now, coming to the topic that we're actually discussing, which is the Digital Personal Data Protection Act uh, 2023 or DPDP 2023, as it's popularly known. Now, this marks a very significant milestone in India's legal landscape. This is, you know, because it addresses the critical need for safeguarding uh, personal information in an increasingly digital world. Now, this has been enacted with a very comprehensive set of regulations with this legislation actually signifying a very profound shift in, in, in uh, you know, India's approach towards privacy. Uh, this act applies to both within and outside the Indian territory and also encompasses a wide range of digital data processing uh, you know, which showcase its its commitment for securing personal information for citizens, even cross border transactions, etc. Uh, now, uh, additionally, this act introduces very robust rights for individuals, granting them uh, greater control over their own data. At the same time, there are a lot of responsibilities that this act is actually putting on on various entities which actually is sort of compelling them to go ahead and prioritize data integrity security and go about very uh, transparently communicate the whole usage of data now there are a lot of uh, you know significant penalties as well that this act is coming uh, up with in case of non compliance uh, with this act so this actually showcases, uh, you know, the whole gravity with which personal information is supposed to be regarded under this legislation. Now, the Data Protection Board of India, which is vested with authoritative powers, is tasked with overseeing implementation and adherence, providing both guidance and enforcing penalties when necessary. Now, this act also represents a very commendable step forward Though it doesn't come without its set of challenges, there are a lot of concerns around privacy exemptions, potential regulatory gaps, all of this which actually warrant very careful consideration. Uh, uh, additionally, you know, we also have to ensure the whole independence and effectiveness of the Data Protection Board. All this is very, very important in case we want to go about enforcing this particular act. Now, with this, you know, I'm I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for today's session. Uh, we have over here Miss uh, Mrs. Divya Jain, uh, who is a chartered accountant and is co-founder of HRD and Company. And uh, HRD and Company has got a clear vision and mission to go ahead and excel in internal audit. Now, over the years, uh, Miss Divya has had the privilege of working with a lot of uh, MNCs and government institutions uh, again. And uh, she actually stumbled upon this whole world of data privacy uh, with the introduction of the GDPR Act that was uh, enacted for the European Union way back in May 2018. Now, since then, she's been involved in helping, uh, you know, a lot of her clients to achieve GDPR compliance, 
and uh, I know she was eagerly waiting for this bill to be passed uh, by the Indian Parliament. We did have a session with her on this uh, back in 2021 also. You know, when at that time, I guess it was just, uh, you know, a piece of paper. But now it's been passed by the parliament. So it's something that uh, uh, it's, it's it's something that all of us need to now really take much more seriously. Now, we can have no better person than Ms. Divya over here. She's an expert, uh, you know, uh, given the way she's gone about studying this whole act the way she's gone about uh, working with various organizations to help them, you know, comply to these regulations. So with this, uh, let me hand it over uh, to Divya. Uh, Divya, the uh, screen is all yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Amit, for the good discussion and brief discussion and, and the introduction as well. And we guess you have set the tone for this complete webinar in a very tight connection. And uh, yes, thank you all of the participants who have joined this webinar that to uh, on our day, which is a very big a day like India Pakistan match. So yes, thank you so, so much. So uh, let me start uh, by sharing my screen with all of you. So yeah, so here is the screen and um, let me start with asking you all a very interesting question that what is the need of digital plus personal data protection act we have so many acts already in india like um, that talks about the data or uh, the personal data also but why there is a specific need of digital personal data protection so uh, let me take you the time when there are a lot of breaches happening all over the world I think you all know about the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, Analytica scandal, where the Facebook user's data was breached and it was used by a Cambridge in Analytica politically confronting firm. And later on, there were a lot of rumors came in that this data was used for a political purpose, like to influence the uh, to influence the uh, the election that was happening in US. So that was a big scandal that happened just because of the breach of the personal data. And then uh, later on, uh, there is a Google Google data was breached, and uh, uh, there was a penalty of fifty million euros on Google. That was under the GDPR because GDPR came in 2018 and the penalty was levied in 2019. The penalty was levied because uh, it was clearly uh, it was clearly shown that Google was not taking the particular concern from the from the data principle for doing the processing and the transparencies were not maintained in the Google. So these kind of scandals are. Uh, data breaches happen all over the world, which trigger the point that there has to have a data privacy. And yes, in all over the world, there are a lot of countries who already have a particular act in place which is running and is running the established and uh, the, principle, the principles and even the procedures are working very well. India has also started working with data privacy and uh, the data privacy act not just all over the world there are a lot of breaches happen in india as well like the air india data breach a lot of air india passengers have lost their data like in 2021 then upstock data breach upstock is like our second biggest stock and uh, stock talking firm and you can even imagine that their data is like breached and a lot of uh, information like who i'm trading shares uh, what I'm trading, how much uh, trading is done in a particular period of time. Like a lot of things were breached during that upstroke data breach and the information for 25 lakh customers was breached. Then these are just the few I'm talking about, like police exam data spill. Then Domino's. I actually did it myself, like a Domino's India data breach. I checked my data was there on the platform that I, how much ordered I, I have given and 
address, my name, my phone number was breached. This is uh, this is the real case that I've checked this data, which was publicly available for downloads. Then the COVID-19 person information was leaked back in 2021. Then just pay that leak. Right? These are just the few that I'm mentioning. If I start from telling you all, then uh, there is no end to the data breaches that happened in a couple of years. So this basically brings us, the Indian government brings us to the point that we have to have a data protection act in place. And let me uh, start this by telling you the journey, how we evolved with the journey of data protection. I am going to show you a video which tell you how data, how much data is important for everyone and how personal data bring, how personal data flows from one point to another point in a digital world. So uh, here is the video. I'm just playing it for you. This is two minutes video. I'm trying to plan a special evening for us. Five years? <laughs> Congrats! Are you proposing? Ha ha. Not at the moment. Oops, I need to get back to work. Have a good one, Cindy. You too. Wow, $10,000. That might be a bit rich for my blood, but maybe it's time to get saving. Oh well, time to move on to other things. That's weird. So, have you been thinking about getting hitched? Cindy, can you mind your own business? Well, I saw that WeddingRings.com and Tuxedo World started following you. That's strange. I checked a wedding ring website, and since then, I keep getting all these e emails, texts, and now Twitter followers about wedding stuff. Did you have to create an account on the website you used? Yeah. And you read the website's privacy policy? No, I figured it wasn't a big deal. Well, just so you know, you should make sure to read the privacy policy next time. The site may have written in language to share your information, which is why you're getting those messages. Oh, I'd better go back and cancel that account before Lindsay starts seeing all these wedding ads. <laughs> Uh-oh, Mr. Timmons wants to see me in his office. Well, good luck, and remember to read the fine... This is, this is the video I want you to see. So basically, this video explains that how we started getting hitched in 2021. So that is why basically we made the Personal Data Protection Act to safeguard our personal data. So yes, here is the journey. So journey begins when, when the Honorable Supreme Court has declared the right to protect the fundamental right in the case of the Swami judgment in 2017. And after that, there was a committee that was formed uh, under the chairmanship of Jeff, Justice Shri Krishna. And then after that, Justice Shri Krishna committee came up with the draft of Personal Data Protection Act 2018. And after that, for, from 2018 till early 2023, there are a lot of ups and downs happened, like the Act 2018, then transferred to the Joint Parliamentary Committee for their comments. And later on, the, the Act was discarded. And then in early 2023, the new Act came in, the DPDP Act, the DPDP Bill 2023. And then finally, it got implemented, enacted on 8th. 11th August 2023 as a digital protect a digital personal data protection act 2023. Even though the act was enacted, but yes, there is a, a long journey and long uh, research has happened. A lot of uh, industry players have given their comments about the implementation, about the execution, and what are the provisions that needs to be um, 
taken and whatever provision is need to be uh, excluded from the uh, from the uh, earlier act and from the uh, from the um, uh, the report given by the justice uh, a joint parliamentary committee so finally we have an uh, act in place which is research for a period of five like more than five years Yes, uh, because of implementation of this act, there is an amendment to few of the existing uh, uh, laws as well. That there is a section 43A in the IT Act 2000, 2000 that is omitted that talks about the compensation for failure to the protect data. In case, uh, so now we have already act in place which talks about the personal data. So there's no need for that particular section. And yes, uh, you heard about the RTI Act. Uh, right to Information Act 2005, which basically uh, gives you uh, gives uh, applicable on the public public um, institution, public companies, where uh, public institutions basically where uh, the person, the individual, have a right to obtain any of the information. So in that case, now the act is applicable, still applicable, but they will not provide the personal information. The personal information will not be disclosed to any of the in, uh, individual. So this is basically the amendment. Now let's talk about the applicability. Before jumping into the applicability, let me tell you the pillars of the Digital Data Protection Act. So the uh, Digital Data Protection Act works on basically two pillars. One is the principle. This act is a principle-based act. And the second, it's, talk, it's more or less talking about the minimization of the personal data. Principles like it, 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 uh, the act is providing the principles for the data fiduciary, the data principles, and all of the stakeholders. And minimization is basically focused on minimizing the personal data. Take the data which is necessary for, for the processing. Do not take the irrelevant data. So basically, the act stands on two different pillars. So, um, yes, to uh, take on the uh, on the applicability, personal data means basically a data about any individual. From that data, any individual can be identifiable or a set of data. Just like the name cannot help you to identify a person, but a name or an email ID can help you identify a person. So, any data which can help which uh, uh, any data or a set of data which can help you identify a person that is a basically a personal data. It applicable to private companies, partnership form, all of the set of index of the uh, set of entities we have in India, it is applicable to all. Then we have two different kind of applicability that is a material scope and the territorial scope. Material scope that personal data, as the name suggests, it is applicable to the digital data that the data we collect in a digital format. In case we collect the data in a in a paper form or a non-digital form, then this act is not applicable. And yes, the data collected in non-digital form, but subsequently we digitize it, then this act is applicable. So if we do we collect the data in a uh, uh, like in a paper form and we are keeping it in a paper form, then in that case, that this act is not applicable. Then we have a territorial scope that it is applicable in India, like within the territory of India. If the processing is of personal data is done within the territory of India, then this act is applicable. Then we have an extra territorial scope as well. If it is applicable outside India as well, if the activity related to goods and services to data principle, which are here in India. Let me give you an example here. Like if I'm here in India and purchasing something from Amazon.com, like a, a, a company, Amazon is here in India, but Amazon.com is a US based, uh, uh, the com based company. So if I purchase something from Amazon, so uh, they are collecting my personal data. Amazon.com is collecting my personal data. In that case, it is applicable to Amazon US as well. But this provision is like too, um, in, uh, too uh, ambiguous as of now and not uh, uh, not very clear because let me give you any other example. Like I'm going to Dubai 
and I'm uh, uh, checking into a, a hotel and they are taking my personal data for the check-in and the, uh, the services are provided in Dubai, the hotel is in Dubai, the company is in Dubai. So they are just collecting my data. So is this um, uh, is this particular act, the DPDP act will be applicable in Dubai hotel? From this particular language, this is mentioned in the act, yes, it is applicable, but still, uh, uh, the clarity and the rules uh, give us more detail about this that uh, will it be applicable in this particular scenario where the services are provided outside India. So we are still hoping for the rules to come in and give us the clarity. Then there are few uh, pointers where the act is not applicable. When the processing of the domestic or personal data Oh, sorry, processing for domestic or personal purpose. Then I'm processing any of my friends' data. I'm collecting his Aadhaar and account detail. I'm processing using it for personal purpose. In that case, this act is not applicable. My friend cannot sue me because I have collected her data. Personal data made publicly available. If I'm publicly providing my data, like I'm putting my videos, my photos on Facebook, Instagram, then in that particular case, if data is for, for publicly available, like my friend can download my data or any organization can download my public data, in that particular case, this act is not applicable. Then research, archiving, and statistics. This is very interesting. Like a lot of research the uh, government agencies are doing, like taking our statistics, taking our biometric during Aadhaar, taking other data like our age, our family members' name, a lot of stuff for different purposes they are collecting that data. So on that research and uh, on that particular research purpose, this act is not applicable. But yes, if someone is doing the commercial research. So as of now, there is no clarity whether this act is applicable on commercial research or not. But yes, in one of the interviews uh, of one of the government officials have mentioned that this uh, act will not be applicable will be applicable on the commercial research, which as of now will come later on in the rules. But still, um, um, on the commercial research, we are hoping that uh, it's not applicable. And then the state instrumentality, sovereignty, and integrity of the India. If anything happens for the sovereignty, integrity of India, then in that particular case, this act is not applicable. Then. Let's talk about the commencement of timeline. The act is already in the, enacted and it's already in place in 11. Lines. The law is, uh, the act is still, um, the, the act is still, um, uh, the, 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 the few of the provisions will be implemented in the phased manner. As I've heard from one of the interviews of one of the ministers that uh, the act will not be applicable just like a GDPR, like two way, two years state uh, exemption to them and two, two years timeline was given. But here the act will be applicable in a phases, like few provisions will be applicable in first phase, few provisions will be applicable in second phase. So as of now, there is no such guidelines. So we are just still hoping that the guidance will come soon. Then there are uh, the, the stakeholders I was talking about. There are four stakeholders principally, principally uh, uh, on which the complete act is um, applicable or the uh, complete act is dependent upon. One is the data principle. The data principle is one whose data was collected. Basically, if my data is collected, then I'm the data principal. And the child is considered as a separately a data principal in this particular act. Then child is also a data principal if the children's data is collected. Then we have data fiduciary. Data fiduciary is uh, uh, the, the whole act is all, the, all around revolving around the data fiduciary because data fiduciary is the one who's collecting the data, processing the data, using the data, using misusing the data and doing everything with our personal data. So basically the uh, data fiduciary is the major or the biggest stakeholder. Then we have data processor. I'll come to the concern manager later. When we have data processor, data processor is basically the extended leg of 
the data fiduciary. Data processor processes the data on behalf of the data fiduciaries. Even though data processor processes the data after having a well valid contract with the data fiduciaries, but still the liability every time lies with the data fiduciary. That's why I was saying that data fiduciary is the biggest stakeholder. Then we have concerned manager. As the name suggests, concerned manager is managing the concern. During the uh, during the, the complete webinar, you'll see that there is an important role the concerned play, the concern that we have, the data principal have to give you concerns. So the data principal, the data man, the concerned manager manages the concern on behalf of the data fiduciary and helping the data principles to give the concern, withdraw the concern, manage the concern, and everything. So the concern manager is basically managing the concerns. Then uh, let's talk about the processing of data. What will be the grounds of processing the data? Basically, the lawful grounds. Uh, mentioned in the act. So there are basically two grounds of uh, lawful grounds of processing the data. One is after taking the consent. If I am giving a consent to process my data, then that is a valid ground. And then there is some other ground that is a legitimate use. There are some uses which are defined as legitimate use. For that particular uses, data fiduciary are not required to have the concern of data principal. Moreover, they are not required to give any privacy notice for the use and that is for legitimate use. So let's take the legitimate use later in the webinar, just after the concern and let's focus on the concern first. The data principal have uh, data fiduciary have to take concern from the data principles whenever they are processing any of their data. And before taking the concern or at the time of taking the concern, data fiduciary have to give a privacy notice to the data principle. So what is basically a privacy notice is all about. Privacy notice is basically, uh, um, let me uh, tell you, um, privacy notice is, um, basically, uh, let me divide a privacy notice in three, three parts, what, when, and how. So what, uh, what is basically what, what personal data that the data fiduciary is taking, what processing they are doing on their data. Even though data, if there is a data processor also, said what data pro processor is doing with the data. So this is basically of what to uh, be mentioned in the privacy notice. Then when, uh, when means the date till when the data will be retained or uh, will not be deleted, will be retained by the data fiduciary. So we need to mention that as well in our uh, privacy notice. Then how is basically how the data principal can communicate with the data fiduciary in case any of issue or breach or any uh, grievance happens. So how uh, is basically uh, how data principal can communicate with the data fiduciary. Here we can give the email ID, the phone number, or some of the contact details of the concerned managers as well. Here the concerned manager prepared to perform our rules, like we can mention the email ID of the concerned manager. But yes, this is something I'm telling you from my experience, but as of now, for the privacy notice, there is no asset prescribed format in the act. Later on, maybe by the rules or something, the privacy notice format may be prescribed, but currently, this is what I am just explaining you. Uh, we are currently doing in the GDPR also. Then let's come back to the concern part. Concern should be freely given. It should not be like putting a gun on my or on my neck on my head and taking a concern. Then it should be specific, specific, informed unconditional, unambiguous, and require affirmation actions. So let me explain require affirmation actions means it should not be like there's a checkbox and already ticked checkbox. There is no point of giving a concern if there's already a checkbox and already ticked and we have to just uh, click on the accept button. So these kind of concerns are not considered to be a valid concern. And specific means for 
all of the purposes for which we are taking the data, taking the personal data, and all the purposes needs to be specifically mentioned in the privacy notice. This is very big, actually, and very, very big. It is specific if we are using the data, like transferring the data to the data processor, the data processor will do this, this, the number of different processing. So we have to take concern for every specific purpose. So this is very, very big, actually. And in case any of the elements from all of the six is not present in the concern, then the consent should be considered as invalid, like not taken. And if consent is invalid, then just like Google, anybody can have a big penalty that we'll discuss later. Then yes, uh, on the basis of consent, data fiduciary can manage, can process the data. And for every uh, specific purpose, specific concern needs to be taken. Then legitimate use. <clears throat> so here are the legitimate use for which the concern is not required. Personal data provided voluntarily by the data vendor. Like I'm voluntarily providing my data. Like uh, I'm uh, voluntarily providing my data to one of the courier agency. Like courier this particular uh, post or a letter or a parcel to this address. When I'm voluntarily providing my data to the data principal, then there is no need of consent. I'm already giving my consent. So consent is not uh, particularly valid in this particular case. Then a uh, consent is not valid, not required if we have to process the data for any under any law or judgment issued under law. If anything comes like from the Supreme Court and any law under any law, then the consent is not required. Nobody actually asks us for the consent, they'll use the data. Mm -hmm. Then responding to the medical emergency. In case any of the medical emergency happens to me, like I'm a data principal and my data needs to be processed without my consent, then yes, that is allowed. And in case any of others person life is into a threat, then the then my personal data can be used if that is a medical emergency. But this is very subjective that uh, threat to the life. The medical institution, the hospitals can use it for the benefit. This is actually very subjective that if they are processing any personal data and it's giving threat to the life of the data principal or any other individual. So more clarification on this particular point is required uh, in the in the rules or maybe amendment to the law. Then maintaining the public order and ensuring safety. It's like maintaining uh, in case of any disaster like a COVID outbreak also. Uh, personal data can be processed to, main to maintain the public order and ensuring the safety. Purposes related to employment. This is very interesting actually. I want to read the actual the law language for you here for the purpose related to employment. The law says for the purpose of employment and those related to safeguarding the employer from loss or liability, such as prevention of corporate espionage, maintenance of confidentiality of trade secrets, intellectual property, classified information, or provision of any service or benefits sought by a data principal who is an employee. So this this complete language I'm reading it says that during the employment, before the employment, after the employment, all such information that is collected by the employer can be processed and the, the, the basically the concern is not required. Even this uh, language is not just covering the employment part, but before the before the employment, like during the interview, a post interview, before the offer letter, all of the information are covered here and can be processed. Performing activities in public interest, if, sent, if anything that happens to have in a public interest, then in that particular case, the concern is not required. Then, as I was mentioning that the complete act is always revolving around the data fiduciary. So yes, there are a lot of obligations for the data fiduciary. Data fiduciary have to comply with a lot of 
obligations in the DPDP Act. First of all, they have to comply with the DPDP Act. Like there are a lot of things or sections or uh, uh, provisions they uh, that a producer have to comply with. First of all, they have to comply with the DPDP Act. Then after that, we put all of the obligations of data fiduciary into um, four buckets. Firstly, um, it's all about implementing the technical and organizational measures to ensure effective adherence to the act. So basically, um, technical implementation is basically having an architecture uh, architecture or technical architecture in place where the data can be safely stored. Uh, the technical architecture basically uh, where the data can be easily accessed, data can be erased, data can be updated. So we need to have that technical in place and then needs to be technical, technical, uh, uh, technical uh, measures in place to safeguard the data, to protect the data that to have a different security measures. So these are basically a technical implementation that data fiduciary have to do. And then we have organizational measures, like we have to have some processes in place, processes for training, processing processes for using the personal data, risk assessment, data breaches inventory, disaster management plans. So we have organizational measures in place for um, for to come to be compliant with this particular act, then we have reasonable security safeguards to prevent data from personal breaches. Yes, we have security safeguards because we are having because this data protection act is applicable only on the digital data. So we have a, we have security measures to safeguard the data which is there in our servers. So we have a reasonable security safeguards. Then the next bucket talks about the data processor to process the data on their behalf of a valid contract. Like we, uh, as a data fiduciary, have to engage only the data processor who have a valid contract. And just having a valid contract will not shift the liability of a data fiduciary to the data processor. And what actually means a valid contract? Valid contract is not specified anyways, like what is valid contract, this constitute valid contract, no. But yes, uh, let me give you a few examples which can constitute a valid contract. Um, like the there must be a transparency clause, like how data processor is processing the data of the data principle. Is there any security measures, like there is a technical and organizational measures at the data processors also? Is there any, uh, are the data processors also have reasonable security safeguards? And it's everything needs to be mentioned in the contract. And also the last point is that <clears throat> data fiduciary have a right to get the data from the data processor at the requirement and have a right to check the data processor structures also to ensure that uh, random check or surprise check. These kind of clauses can be mentioned to have a valid contract. Then uh, the next buckets talk about the erasure and deletion of data by the data fiduciary once the processing is done. As of now, there is no such timeline uh, prescribed in the act that when you have to delete the data, or till now, till this particular time, you have to save the data. But yes, it is clearly mentioned that once the data, the, the purpose is completed for which the data is required, then the data needs to be deleted or erased. Like I have given my data particularly for a purpose of um, let's say uh, I'm enrolling for a webinar, like you guys have enrolled it, and I have given my data for that particular purpose then yes, the data needs to be erased when the purpose is completed. It should not be used for any other purpose. And if the data is required to be saved for a particular for particular timeline because of any other legacy or any other law, like bank have to save a data for a particular timeline, then in that case, the data needs to be saved for a particular timeline. But yes, only the core particular data which is required, not the personal data, if not required.
Then we have a uh, uh, we then report personal data breaches to data protection rule and the data principle. This is very big obligation that data fiduciary have to report to the data protection rule and the data principle whenever any breach happens. And yes, for reporting the breach, data fiduciary have to have a process or a technical measure in place that they come to know that breach has happened. So yes, um, for uh, giving the for uh, reporting the breach, as of now, there is no such timeline or there is no such format given under the Act that when the breach is to be reported within this this format, there is no such guy uh, precise formats are given. But currently, uh, what we are expecting that it should be as soon as possible. Like whenever the breach happen, it should be or communicated ASAP to the protection data protection board and the data principal. There is another uh, thing in this particular uh, report, uh, personal data breaches. There is also cyber attack information. Uh, as for the cert, needs to be given within a period of six hours. Like, so we are not here. We need not to be confused between these two acts. As per cert, the cyber attack information should be shared within six hours. But but uh, but it 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 is always not possible. It it is always not like the case that wherever cyber attack happened, the uh, personal data is also breached. So if the cyber attack information is already shared or is shared as per that act, we have to share the information if the personal data is breached as per the DPDP act. So we are not uh, we do not have to confuse between these two reporting. The these two reporting can be run as parallel and if can be run singular or can be run parallel. Then the court bucket talks about the obligation is that we have to obtain a clear, concise, uh, provide a clear, concise and a comprehensible notice to the data principle that we have already discussed in the previous slide that we have to give them a, a comprehensive notice. And yes, um, one point I skipped the to tell you that notice should be in English language and 22 other languages which, were, which are there in the constitution of India. So if anyone is running the website in different states of India, so they are not uh, required to just provide a notice in English. They have to provide in the regional language also. So there are 22 languages which are mentioned in our constitution. Obtain verifiable parental concern. This we'll discuss and we'll discuss about the uh, uh, children's data. Then uh, let's talk about the data, significant data fiduciary, the big data fiduciary. So who are basically the significant data fiduciary? Uh, there is no such guidance as of now in the app who talks about who are the significant data fiduciary. But yes, on the basis of the uh, the, the joint parliamentary committee um, opinions or the statements and the lot of um, things or the comments from the industry, we have come to know that significant data fiduciary will be determined on the basis of any of any or few of these measures like volume and sensitivity of the personal data process, right, uh, risk to the right of the data principle, potential impact on the sovereignty and integrity of India, risk to electoral democracy and security of state and public order. Like who will be the significant data fiduciary having the processing the large volume of data. So basically the act have given the power to the government, then they'll notify the who will be the significant data fiduciary. They will notify actually this company will be the significant data fiduciary. So as of now, there is the notification is still uh, not passed out. So there is no actual data, significant data fiduciary as on current date. In addition to the obligation that we have discussed for the data fiduciary, there are three additional obligations for the significant data fiduciary that they have appointed data protection officer based in India. This is not the concerned manager. Concerned manager is separate and data protection officer is separate and that has to be based in India. Then appoint an independent data auditor. 
they need to have an independent data auditor. Then they conduct the data protection impact assessment and periodic audit. So these three uh, obligations are in addition to other obligations for the significant data fiduciary. Then, uh, as we were discussing about the obligations of data fiduciaries, there is obviously some rights for the data principles because rights and obligation always runs in synchronization. So there are total five rights for the data principles. And yes, there are some obligations or basically the duties also for the data principles. So basically we as a data principle have few duties as well. So let me take, uh, let discuss firstly the rights of the data principle. Right to information. This is not the art right to information. This is right to assess information. Uh, there is some error in the PPT basically. Right to assess the information. Right to correction and erasure. Right to nominate. Right to grievance redressal. And right to withdraw the consent. Let's go one by one. Right to access information means the data principle have the right to obtain information from the data fiduciary, like how the data is processed, which personal data is taken, which personal data is processed for which purpose, what is the current state of the data. So basically, uh, current state means uh, the, the actual data, uh, personal data is processed for how much time the data will be retained. So these kind of information, the data fiduciary, data principle has a right to obtain these kind of information from the data fiduciaries. And the data fiduciary has an obligation to provide these kind of information. And for this, they have to have that kind of structure in place. Then uh, for a right to correction and eraser, data principle has a right once they have a right to information, they see what all information the data fiduciary is keeping, then they have a right to correction. Then they'll say, this, this, please in update my this, 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 this information. So they have a right to correct the information, right to update the incomplete data, and a right also to erase the data. Please erase my data. I'll say to my data fiduciary, please erase my data that is no longer required for processing. So data principle, me as a data principle, have these kind of rights. Then let's skip the third one and come to the fourth one right away. That is right to grievance redressal. Data principle has a right to, to um, readily available means, re, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, data principle have a right to grievance redressal. Data principle have a right to provide any of the grievance to the concerned manager and also to the data fiduciaries. And the data fiduciaries have the obligation to provide the appropriate solutions to the data principles. Means me as a data principle, data principle have a right if I have any grievance, then I have a right to go to the debt control manager, to the fiduciaries, to, and they have to listen me on my on that part. Then also, apart from that, we have a data protection board also. If my uh, uh, my grievances are not uh, properly taken care by the concerned managers and the data fiduciary, then we can go uh, to the higher uh, authorities as well. That is the data protection officer. That we'll discuss later. Then we have a right to withdraw consent. Data principal has given the consent for this five particular purposes. And now the data principal wants to withdraw the concern for these two purposes. Yes, data principle can do that. Data principle can uh, withdraw the concern for one purpose, two purpose, or can withdraw the uh, uh, withdraw the concern for complete, uh, for, with completely withdraw the concern. So these are the four rights. Then we have a right to nominate, that is the third one right. This is a very uh, different or a unique right. This, uh, this kind of right was not there in any of the uh, data protection act which are already which are already there in uh, which are already there in place like the gdpr uh, just to think yeah 
so sorry. Then um, this is a very specific right which was not seen in any of the other privacy act like GDPR, other different acts which are applicable in different different countries. Right to nominate is basically in the in the case of death of the data principle and the incapacity of the data principle. The data principle has a right to nominate any other individual. So uh, this is very unique. And as of now, the process of uh, uh, nominating or whom to nominate is not yet notified. But yes, uh, we'll see uh, later on this in the rules. One very important thing is that right to information, correction, and erasure of personal data, like the right number one and right number two of personal data is applicable only when the ground of processing is concerned. In case the ground of processing is legitimate use, legitimate use that we have discussed just before uh, two, three slides, then in that case, the data principles do not have a right to information and do not have a right to correction and erasure. Okay, then let's come to the obligation part. The data principle, the data principle have, do not have to register any false or a false or complaint. You do not have to register any such complaint and do not furnish any false, particular, or impersonate any other person in a specified case. Do not behave or do not uh, present like any other person, then in that case, this is the responsibilities or basically set as obligation for the data principle. And in case any data principle found to be in uh, um, violation of any of our duties, then there is a penalty also like for a piece of 10,000. Then let's talk about the cross-border transfer of data. Uh, this act state where it talks about the transfer of data, that transfer of data is allowed. With the consent of data subject or a data principle, transfer is allowed to any other country. This act just talks about that central government will restrict the country. The government will restrict the countries on which the to which the transfer is not allowed. So as of now, there is a blanket exemption of transfer of data to any other country. But here are few issues or concerns that you like that uh, that comes out because of this provision. That central government may not notify country and territories to which the transfers are restricted and prohibited, and it 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 means that if any of the country is restricted and prohibited then we cannot transfer the data to that country. So hostings and all the data servers in that particular country, let's say country X is notified by central government as a prohibited or restricted country, then we cannot have any our personal data of Indian citizens in that country. Any, com any company cannot run their website in that particular country. We cannot do business in that particular country. So this provision is not very clear about how the data, uh, how the country's restriction will work. Either the uh, uh, central government will come up with blanket prohibition that if the data uh, will not be transferred to any other country and if the data will be transferred, the safeguard will be taken. But as of now, such provisions are not here. No clarity on prospective implementation of the provision. Yes, there is no clarity to how the provision will be implemented later on. We are just waiting for the rules here. No clarity on impact of existing personal data. Like I was mentioning that um, um, if, if the country acts is prohibited and currently as on today, there are a lot of companies posting their website, maintaining a server, server in that particular country. So how 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 they have to manage this if they are running their business in India. So either they have to stop running their business in India or they have to change the place of their servers and the hosting. And yes, the one more important thing is that if, if any of the secretarial law, which provides for higher degree of protection, like an insurance act, they provide that data need not to be transferred to any other country. 
So in that particular case, the Digital Data Protection Act talks that we can transfer the data to, to country Y that it is allowed, it's not restricted, then we can transfer the data. But Insurance Act, as per the Insurance Act, it, it, it's, it's restricted, it's not allowed. Then, then the, this act particular says that the higher degree of protection or restriction will prevail. Like in this particular case, the provisions of the insurance insurance act will prevail. So this particular section of the cross border transfer of data is very very unclear as on today, and a lot of rules and regulations have to come to bring in a lot of clarity because uh, transferring a data to any particular uh, country where the privacy laws are not there, and we are not sure about the privacy law in that particular country. Uh, so there is a lot of ambiguity as on today here. So let's talk about the children's data. Children's data are uh, children's are also one of the data principles, and the children data are more vulnerable. So there are specific provisions relating to the data of children. Children verifiable concern needs to be taken from the guardian and from the parents for the children data. So let me tell you who is the children first. Anybody uh, less than the age of 18 considered to be as children in as per the Digital Data Protection Act. But uh, I think 18 is a, a age which is there in all of the other acts in India. But here for providing the concern, let's say I have to play a video on Google and I'm 17 years old. And now uh, because my age is not 18, I have to take my Google has or YouTube has to take concern from my guardian. So the age 18 is um, is um, no, it's similar to other acts in India, but yes. Uh, currently, for Children's Data and Digital Protection Act, also the age is 18. That before the age of 18, the guardian and parent concerns are required to be taken by the data fiduciaries. Processing of personal data should not result in detrimental or well-being of the child. This is very big thing that um, uh, the data processors or the data fiduciaries are not are not allowed to do any such processing which is detrimental on the well-being of a child. So even after having the concern, they are not required, they are not supposed to do anything which can create an impact on the well-being of the child. Then there is a prohibition on the tracking or behavioral monitoring of a child children. So this is also an obligation, particularly for children. Like if you are tracking the data of a children, then do not track or behave or monitor the behavior of the children. So um, this is something very uh, uh, blanket, or uh, blanket, uh, uh, blanket prohibition for the data fiduciaries that in they are not tra track or monitor the behavior of the children. So how they can market? Like nowadays everything is uh, running on the basis of behavior. So how they can they will use the children's data for? marketing or target marketing and even the target marketing for the children's are also not allowed and uh, data fiduciary are not used are not allowed to use the data for the targeting marketing to the children so this is very unclear and um, a lot of issues and concerns um, um, we have seen during a couple of uh, weeks um, since when the data protection act is in place that a lot of fiduciaries are uh, raising a concern on this particular uh, particular provision of the act then uh, but yes there is an exemption also for certain data fiduciary there is a provision that um central government can exempt few of the data fiduciaries uh, from this uh, verifiable consent of garden ga guardian and parent for a particular age like um like uh, one of the examples was mentioned that in case the the, the government has uh, uh, can vouch or can uh, observe that there is a safety or uh, safe processing is done by the data fiduciary then the then the age of children can be reduced to can be 
reduced for parent and parental concern to 13 years, 12 years, or maybe 14 years. So that, that will be depend upon case to case and observed on the basis of uh, the data fiduciaries and um, the, um, the, the, the government uh, opinions. Then there are a few other or the remaining provisions of the uh, personal uh, digital data protection act that uh, volume and nature of uh, considering the volume and nature of personal data the central government may uh, notification exempt certain provisions of the act for a data fiduciary or a class of data fiduciaries. Uh, this is a, a clear exemption to uh, to the central government that they can uh, provide the exemption to any of the data fiduciaries and data processors or a class of data fiduciaries that this, this, this provision is not applicable on you. When the concern for the processing personal data was provided before the commencement of this act, data fiduciary need to provide detailed provide like uh, this is basically when the before the commencement of this act if there is uh, some personal data already processed by the data fiduciary and the consent is taken then in that case after the implementation of this act the data fiduciary have to provide a notice to the data principles that we have processed your data for this, this purpose we have taken this 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 your part this particular of your personal data so they have to provide the first privacy notice and in case the consent is not taken, like as on today the act is enacted and the data fiduciary is processing some of the data and the consent is not in place, then they have to take the consent. Then the central government may upon ensuring if the processing is not verifiably safe. This I was talking to about while discussing the uh, children's data. That the central government may check if the processing for a particular data fiduciary is verifiably safe, then notify the age of our data fiduciary shall exempt from applicability of children's personal data obligation. Then they can reduce the age to 13 years, 12 years, as we are uh, assuming it to be 13 years, because in GDPR also the age of the children was 13 years. So it, it, it's a wild guess, basically. Then data principal shall exhaust the opportunity of redressing her grievance with data fiduciary before approaching the data protection board of India. So we'll discuss the data protection board of India. So I will discuss this provision there. So here we are talking about the data protection board. What is the data protection board? This is a particularly a specific authority that will be created under this act. And the central government will use their notification create this independent board to be called the data protection board of India. This board basically uh, runs by the chairperson and other man, other members who shall be appointed by the central government. What is the responsibility of the board? So board will check, uh, first of all, uh, help in implementation of the act. Check if the implementation is correctly going on. Determine the non-compliances and uh, redress the grievances. Uh, then uh, also imposing the penalties, issuing the direction mediations also, and ensuring the compliance with law. So basically, the overall board will help uh, the Indian government to implement the law in India and uh, helping the different fiduciaries, concern managers, and the different data principles to resolve and uh, resolve the issues and. Uh, resolve the issues and also take the law in a more mature stage. Then the board will also have the power to hear the complaint against the concern managers. The concern manager basically have to register with the data protection board. This is currently is not in place. It is not mentioned in the somewhere in the act, but yes, um, as we are uh, observing it, from the from the from different different uh, sources that the uh, concern manager needs to register themselves with the board and whenever there is some uh, complaint uh, against the com concern manager it has to come firstly to the data fiduciary and if the data fiduciary are not able to resolve the complaints then it has to go to the data protection board then central government will have the power to block the data fiduciary platform 
So let me tell you how the grievance will follow, the grievance process will follow. First of all, if data principal have any grievance, it will directly go to the concern manager and to the data fiduciary. If any one of them will not able to resolve the issue, it will go to the data protection board. If the data protection board will not able to resolve it, then they have the follow, then they have the following option. Once they pass the order, they'll be able to resolve. They'll ask you to go to the dispute resolution authority. And then apart from that, they also have the option in case the data fiduciary are found to be guilty, then they can block the data fiduciary platform to run in India. Even though after um, the order of the data fiduciary, we can go to the, the high court Supreme Court and to the telecom dispute settlement and the appellate tribunal and then to the high court and Supreme Court. But yes, the data protection boards with this anti government permission have the authority to block a data fiduciary platform. Then, consider then one very interesting thing is that if in during any hearing or any of the grievance of the data principle, it is found that the data fiduciaries are guilty. Then data fiduciary can give a voluntary undertaking that they will not do this, these things, and they can accept all of the issues, and then they can give a voluntary uh, undertaking to the data protection board. Then data protection board can accept it. And if later on they can see if the data fiduciary is completely following with the in compliance with the undertaking given by the data fiduciary, if not, at that point of time, the data protection board can penalize the data fiduciary. So this is very interesting and not seen in any of the um, other laws. But yes, this can be misused also. And yes. Uh, one of the uh, other point here is that the chairperson and other members are appointed for a period of two years, and yes, they are also um, can be reappointed. But yes, for the, the 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 period for appointment is just the two years. Then let's come to the penalty provisions in case the data fiduciary data principles are not able to complete the obligation, then there are few penalties also. And the penalties are not very really less. The penalties are very really big, like ranging from 50 crore INR to 250 crores INR. But for data principle, there is a state penalty, like if the data principle is not able to complete their duties. Like we have discussed few of the duties that they will not in the first mail and they will not do any uh, false uh, complaint and like the two or three of their duties. Then in that case, there is a uh, state away penalty of rupees for 10,000. Then there are other penalties and the penalties are basically ranging from 50 crore, 50 crore to 50 crore basic basis, basis on the, uh, the sensitivity of the data or the um, basically the sensitivity or sensitivity sensitivity of the data how sensitive the data is basically so if there is any um, a breach on the part of data fiduciary to take a reasonable steps to safeguard and prevent the personal data then in that case the penalty is up to rupees 250 crores the highest penalty in this act is 250 crores and if the data fiduciary uh, do not take reasonable steps to prevent the personal data, then they have to suffer with the highest penalty. Then uh, there is a penalty of 200 crores in particularly two cases when the data fiduciary is not able to provide uh, to the data uh, principal and the data protection board about the breaches. Then in that case, the penalty is 200 crores and in case there is any breach in observance of any data related to children on a part of data fiduciary then in that case also the penalty is 200 crores then uh, there is a penalty of 150 crores 
this is related to uh, related uh, in regard to the additional obligation like data protection officer independent auditor and data protection impact assessment in that particular cases for the significant data fiduciary there is a penalty of 150 crores like in out of these three if that significant data fiduciary is not able to complete any or there is any breach in completing that obligation then there is a penalty of 150 crores so basically Significant data fiduciary have a penalty of 150 crores for these three clauses and have a penalty of 250 crores in case they are not able to have a reasonable security safeguards in place. So uh, these both are can be applicable simultaneously to the data um, to the significant data fiduciaries. And uh, then there is a last penalty of rupees 50 crores if there is breach on any other provision of this act then the penalty will be rupees 50 crores so the least penalty is 50 crore if any of the provision is not complied with let's say if the consent is not valid then there is a 50 crores penalty for all of the provision that we have discussed if the consent is not taken consent is not valid notice is not given notice is not given in regional language any of the provision then the minimum penalty is 50 crores then uh, there are few um, differences that are charted out between the GDPR, the journal data, journal data protection regulation, and then um, when I was just discussing DPDP Act, so I forgot all other rights which are uh, here um, uh, in different countries. So yeah, so first is, uh, first is journal data protection, uh, journal data protection regulation, and then the digital data protect, uh, digital personal data protection, the DPDP Act. So there are just few differences. The differences are uh, these differences that I've mentioned here are very much important. <clears throat> so let's take uh, first, um, uh, firstly the GDPR. GDPR applies to processing of personal data wholly or partly automated means personal data in digital format, personal non-digital format, but here are personal data, the Indian Act, I'll just mention the Indian Act and the GDPR so that there will be no confusion. So in, in Indian Act, the Act is applicable only on digital personal data and the GDPR is applicable on personal data, either in digital format or a a non-digital format like a physical format. Penalties also in GDPR, uh, the penalties are very high, like uh, to, can extend to 20 million euros and 4% of the global turnover. But here the penalties are extended up to 50 crores. The age, minor age under 16 year need parental concern. Member state of Europe can lower this to 13 years so in lot of the uh, lot of the state in in various states the age is 13 years the member state already passed the resolution to lower the age to 13 years but in our uh, indian act if the age for the concerned is 18 years breach should be notified in 72 hours in gdpr but uh, in Indian Act, there is no such timeline. As I was mentioning earlier, we, that there must be a timeline. But uh, currently, there is no timeline. We are expecting it that it has to be as early as possible so that the data principal get to know that which data is compromised. GDPR do not have any right to nominate. And, uh, but they have a right to portability that they can uh, port the data from the data fiduciary within 30 days, data fiduciary have to respond. And in Indian Act, there is an additional right to nominate, but there is no right to data portability in this particular Indian Act. GDPR uh, prescribed the format for, prescribed the mechanism basically for transferring the data to the third, third uh, to the different countries, to the overseas countries basically. But currently in Indian Act, uh, there is a blanket exemption of transferring the data to different countries. And even though the mechanism is not specified, yes, though we are expecting the mechanism to be coming under the rules. Then uh, the, in the GDPR, both controllers and processors are under the obligation to appoint a data protection officer. In our Indian Act, uh, only the significant data fiduciaries are uh, are mandatorily required to appoint a data protection officer. Data controllers and data 
processes are required to maintain the record of processing activities. Yes, in GDPR, they have to maintain that this processing has been conducted. Like they have to maintain a trail of processing uh, data controllers and the data processors. But uh, there is no obligation for data processes, uh, data fiduciaries or data processors in India to maintain any such records of processing like this. Like there are n number of processing is done. Storage is also processing. Storage in one place to storage in other place. So there is no trail. There is no obligation on the data fiduciary and data processor to maintain a trail of it. GDPR does not explicitly uh, specify to provide notice to regional languages. Uh, they might be like they are just giving the uh, blanket thing that they have to provide the notice in English. But here uh, there is a uh, because a lot of uh, people in different states are reading different languages. So here there is a state away uh, obligation of providing the notice in. In 22 Indian language in addition to English. Then uh, data, data protection impact assessment is to be conducted by data controllers for high risk processing activities. But here in Indian Act, data fiduciaries are obligated to conduct periodic data protection impact assessment from an independent auditor. Then, so this is all about the act. And the differences we have with GDPR. Um, I uh, this is uh, this is all about the regulations. Now there are some issues that I've observed while um, going through the act in last couple of weeks and reading the different industry uh, uh, comments and also the interviews of different ministers and in in, in fact the uh, telecom ministers as well. Uh, so there are a few issues that I uh, I want to share with you all. The bill does not regulate harm arising from processing of personal data. Like if I'm the one and my personal data is compromised, so uh, it, it may ca cause some harm to me. So there is no specific provision to quantify this harm. There is no penalty for, there is a penalty for particular, like uh, there are different penalties that I've discussed. And even all these penalties will be uh, um, like if, if, if the data protection officer or data protection board will put a penalty on any of the company, then the penalty will be given to the government and it will be uh, submitted or transfer to the consolidated fund of India. It is clearly mentioned that the penalty will be given transfer to the consolidated fund of India. But as a data principle, if I'm suffering, I'm having some harm. So that is not mentioned anywhere. If even my data is compromised, I'm suffering and there is no, uh, no provision provided particularly for this thing. Even the uh, even in the previous uh, versions of this act and the Shri, uh, Shri Krishna committee also. There was few discussion going on that there needs to be a way or a means to quantify this harm and penal compensation need to be given to the data principal as well. But currently in the app, this thing is missing. Shorter appointment may impact the independence of the board. So as I've mentioned that there is just a two year appointment for the data protection board members so two years uh and but they are eligible for reappointment but two years is quite very really less as like when anybody has to start working so two years are quite less of uh, tenure for understanding and uh, implement and it also hit on the independence of a particular person so this considered to be one of the issues with the act exemption from notice for Concern may not be appropriate. So the bill empowers the central government to notify certain fiduciaries or class of fiduciaries, including startup for certain obligations, including notices. So this is considered to be inappropriate that um, as we have already mentioned, few of the legitimate use for which the concern is not required. And now the data fiduciaries will be exempted from the concern. So uh, this sounds to be very um, ambiguous currently. And uh, the next is the right to data portability and right to be forgotten not provided. In our current 
previous versions of the act, the bills or the joint parliamentary committees comment everywhere and even the global uh, data privacy act, the right, the right to data portability and right to forgotten are provided. But here in our act, these rights were purposefully dropped out. Even in the previous version, were, both the rights were there. And now since these rights are purposefully, purposely dropped out. So um, the reason for the same is still expected. And um, yeah. And now uh, the last two things are adequacy of protection in case of cross-border transfer of data. As a, we have already discussed in detail that the, the cross-border transfer in current scenario is very, uh, very uh, uh, like it's exempt for all of the countries. And uh, but yes, uh, might be some rules can come up which can help in understanding how the exemption will work. And there are a lot of issues, like one of the issues, as, as I've already discussed, like if, if the one of the countries is restricted, then uh, restricted from transferring the personal data, then having any business with that particular country is not possible. So this is very big thing. Then exemption to state may have adverse implement, implication of the privacy. This is everywhere in the news that uh, exemption to state is uh, state is very um, very very important, very very negative for this particular privacy act. Even though um, the the act got delayed for a period of five years because in, each, in the initial uh, versions. There was no exemption to the state. State means the central government, state government, local bodies, and the authorities as defined in the constitution. So, uh, uh, but we have observed uh, during last um, five years during the journey of this act is uh, everybody, uh, the state wants to get them exempted from the processing of data, like they have the Aadhaar data, biometric details, or the very crucial data they have, and they now have the exemption to process that data as well. So it is definitely uh, putting an uh, impact on the privacy as a fundamental right of ours. <laughs> then, uh, yes, now we come to an end. One uh, big thing I want to say here is that I think I have missed while going through the complete presentation that uh, we were discussing here about the let the about the legitimate use like in this in these particular cases like six cases the consent is not required so consent is not required doesn't mean that act is not applicable here in these particular cases only the consent is not required processing will be done data fiduciary have the obligation to uh, protect the data to put the security measures to uh, like to treat it like a personal data but just the concerned part is missing there is a lot of confusion when i was uh, going through different articles that um a lot of people have an opinion that if concern is not required it means it's not a personal data and the whole complete act is not available no it's not like that here the concern taking concern from me is not applicable but you still have the data, you have to still protect it. So this uh, point I have, I think I skipped while explaining it. Then we have a journey to compliance. Um, first of all, this journey is basically if we have to see how we have to comply with the Data Protection Act. But yes, every organization have to have their tailor-made solution for it. They have to see where they are currently lying like uh, they are lying in the current in the starting like they have a privacy policy or not they have the privacy policy are they taking the consent or not are they have a proper architecture or technical feasibility in a technical architecture in place technical um, technical um, so uh, technical technicalities to erase the data technically um, uh, uh, technical feasibility to provide the access of the data. So these kind of things, every organization have to assess and do the data privacy assessment. Then after that, um, where ever, and on all of the points they are lagging behind, they have to have a data privacy framework development. Like if, uh, let's say from the 10 points, they are not having 
core points like they do not have architecture in place, they are not storing the data properly, they are not able to retrieve the data. So they have to work on it and to have a privacy framework development. Then data discovery and mapping. So basically, this is something that every organization have to have their own set of compliance journey to the Data Protection Act. Map the data, then privacy risk assessment. We need to check uh, uh, as per the current practices we are following, how, how much risk is there and how much we can still work on it. Then third party risk management, just like um, we have to see, we are working with the data processors. We have to see how, how, uh, how, like how much risk is there or the risk assessment. We have to check their risk assessment as well. The how risk, how much risk is there and how risky position we are in with them. And we have to have a valid contract. In some of the cases, we do not have a contract. They're just doing the work. So we have to have a valid contract. And it's not just with the data processors. We have to have this kind of situation with all of the persons with whom we are sharing our data. So uh, we have to work with all of our third, third parties. Then we have to work on privacy in enhancing enhancing technologies. We have to put a safety security safeguards in place. We have to decide on the basis of the risk assessment that these security safeguards we have to work on. And then the internal audit assistance, we can uh, do the uh, privacy audit to decide. And we keep on doing the, uh, it's on a periodical basis to see how the complete process or the complete privacy structure is working. Then yes, the last but not the least, the team training and awareness. We have to train uh, and uh, give the awareness to our employees and the complete organization about the privacy, how to use the personal data, how the data will work, how the processes will work so that they will have the understanding in place that uh, how crucial the personal data is. So this is all about uh, the Digital Personal Data Protection Act from my side. And yes, uh, uh, in the last, the act is still evolving and everybody is having their own opinions. I seriously try to uh, make the give the presentation in as per the law. I'm not giving my any opinion just in the last three slides, the key issues. These are not just the opinions which I have framed from my uh, framed uh, on the basis of different interviews and from the different articles that I've read. But yes, the act is evolving and everybody is made, having their own opinions on that. So um, yes, but this presentation, I try to put in as per the law words. So thank you so much for listening very patiently. Now I'm ready to uh, take the questions. Uh, thanks, uh, oh, thanks. Divya. This uh, actually Divya. was a very engaging discussion and you kept talking continuously for close to 90 minutes. So kudos for that. Uh, and I think uh, there are a lot of questions that I actually have on the chat window. So I'll just quickly go through them. Yeah. Uh, we have the first question by Mr. Ramakrishna. He's asking, what are the top three compliance areas that we need to keep in mind while auditing the processes where personal information is being shared with the vendor? Yeah, so vendors are basically, uh, as I was mentioning in the last, of the session, last part of the presentation as well, Vendors or the data processors, we have to see, we need to have a valid contract with them. First of all, if we do not have a valid contract, so during audit, we have to see either we have a valid contract with them, but what data processing they are doing, what first, how they are personal using the data, how they are saving the personal data, what structure they are using, are they doing the kind, kind the audits like, we are doing it for data fiduciary. We have to see either the vendors also following that particular process or not. So these kind of uh, checkpoints we can take care of during our audit of data fiduciary. Thanks. Uh, there's a follow-up question on this. 
uh, what all uh, what are the contract clauses that we need to review and any comment from an internal audit standpoint so basically uh, as i was mentioning that um there is no there is no standard contract as uh, we are working with google let's say for data server so we have to have a contract in place where few clauses like on uh, the data needs to be available whenever the data subject or the data principal is asking to access we have to have a process in place for the erasure of data we have to have a play procedure in place for particularly erasure of data after the processing is done so these kind of clauses or the transparency, these needs to be mentioned in the contract itself. Because if the, these are not mentioned in the contract, then we do not have any idea how the data processor is using the data. And uh, we also can uh, see and go and check the structure, how they are maintaining the data. This is not possible. Might be this is possible with Google as well, but I've seen in my uh, like few of the clients that uh, they are working very closely with data processors and they are doing the audit of the data processor. Like data for DC, we are appointing an independent auditor for the data processors and uh, on the basis of risk assessment is also done by the data fiduciary's auditor for the data processor so that uh, there will be a transparency in that. Thank you. Uh, then there's a question by Ms. Ranjana, uh, which states is, if any clause that was applicable earlier, but is not applicable according to the data protection bill and covered in the audit review period before the latest Data Protection Act passed on 11th August 2023, then in that scenario, can we go for the latest one or go as passed earlier? So basically, as of now, the act is enacted, but a lot of the provisions are still uh, waiting for the implementation. The provisions are still not implemented. So currently, because uh, the provisions have a lot of issues with them, or a lot of information is missing because the, the rules are still, um, still, still pending. So what I suggest is we can go with the the clause which is already in place but yes if something is here in the data protection act as well and give you some better assurance and give you some better uh insurity then we can plug these both but yes uh if 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 the provision is missing in the data protection act then, then we cannot miss the particular thing because it's not there in the data protection act. we need to go for the better uh assure, assurance fair point Okay, another question by Mr. Kabali. He's uh, asking a question on the consent manager. Can you explain a little bit on this person who's appointed by the data principal or the data fiduciary? An example would help. Consent manager is basically not appointed by the data principal. Like if I am a data fiduciary, like if I'm collecting different uh, data of different data principles that I have to appoint a consent manager, who will directly contact with the data principal because data principal have to give a consent. And for them, it is not easy for provide the consent and I might be asked to take a consent for let's say 10 different parameters or different processing. And I'm not always available to, to communicate with the data principal. So I will delegate my this responsibility particularly to the concerned manager so that the concern will not become a hassle and concern process will become easy for the data principal and for the data fiduciary. So basically it will be a bridge between data fiduciary and the data principals. Okay. Okay, then there's a question by Ms. Ranjana. Is it safe to install the true caller application? Sorry? Is it safe to install the true caller application? A um, lot of these kind of uh, applications are not safe. and um, But yes, a um, lot of people are using these kind of applications like AnyDesk, True Caller, DreamWear. And in fact, Zoom also without paid version. A lot of person data is like provided on the, those particular platforms. But yes, um, I'm not saying that these are uh, for for safe. If okay. you want to be sure about it, then use the paid version. 
Another follow-up question by Mr. Kabali. Uh, erasing the data after the purpose is accomplished. Any particular timeline that is defined in the Act, uh, ASAP sounds a bit subjective and is debatable. No, there is no timeline uh, defined in the Act as of now. But we are expecting that such timeline will come in the rules or something like this that um, data fiduciary will be provided in their notices that uh, once this process will be completed, the data will be erased and they will provide the timeline, like let's say two years, three years. So as of now, there is no such timeline and even there is no obligation on data fiduciary to provide the timeline as well. So this ASAP word, uh, I come across uh, because uh, I was just, I think, uh, listening to one of the interview. So I uh, just come across that one of the member of the party, uh, particularly I think the telecom minister was mentioning that, that's something uh, that uh, the data data has to be deleted. Once the processing is done, it has to be done ASAP. So that's why I mentioned that particular thing here. Okay. There's another question by Mr. Fadnis. Uh, can the internal auditor act as an independent data auditor? Uh, there is no restriction in this law, particularly, but um, uh, and in fact, um, uh, I is not saying anything like that as well that there is any restriction because this law is very new. So I think uh, uh, yes, uh, they can work. One person can work on both the things because uh, data protection audit is also like internal audit. But yes, um, one thing is that that uh, the data protection officer will not have to work in the creation of the policies, which is we are not doing as an internal auditor or as an internal auditor also. So they will not get indulged in the making the policies, procedures and all. But yes, they can review it in the audit. Okay. Another question by Mr. Kabali. This is on the significant data fiduciary, the independent data auditor. So one, what is the frequency of such audit? Second, what is the scope for a practicing CIA or a CA in this area? If you can throw some light on this. Well, what was the first point? I got the second it was, point. Yeah, what is the frequency of such audit? Okay, okay. So in the act, it is mentioned as periodically. There is no frequency that is mentioned as of now. So in the rules, we are expecting to have some frequency either yearly within three years or five years. But um, in the act, the act is silent as on red on this particular topic. And uh, if we talk about the opportunities, for CAs and uh, particularly for internal auditors, I think this is a very emerging field for the internal auditors because they already have the knowledge of the processes. They are working like directly with the organization of the processes. They are not just lagging behind, they are just lagging behind on the technical part. So with the help of that technical person in place, we as the internal auditor and chartered accountants can play a very good role in the organization help them how can they have a privacy policy how can they have a, like in the flowchart basis and in the return documentary basis we can help them to have a proper structure in place great to the next question i can perhaps answer this there's someone who's asking if we can share this presentation by email so yeah unfortunately we won't be able to share the presentation by email however we will be posting this training on our on the IIA India YouTube channel. So for for you and even everyone else, uh, please go and refer to the YouTube channel of IIA India, where you'll be able to access this particular training. Yeah, please do that so that I'll get good views. <laughs> okay, uh, another question. Uh, can you help us form strategies for our company in relation with data protection? Yes. Contact me. My email ID is there in the beginning. Okay. Then if yes, how can we connect with you? So, yeah, I mean, uh, we did display the channel in case you have any further questions or how we can connect. Uh, you can write to IIA. We'll definitely pass on the connection to Divya. Okay. Another question from Mr. Fadnes. Uh, how much are 
data protection laws effective in the day of artificial intelligence? In artificial intelligence? So basically, uh, as I was uh, mentioning about the research and uh, there is exemption, particularly in research and stat statistical research that this act is not applicable to. So artificial intelligence is uh, based on the research currently because on the basis of the research, the artificial intelligence and different boards are working on. So currently what we are observing from the act that it is not applicable on the research, statistical research. And even though they are not, uh, the commercial research are not also not exempted from that research, statistical research. So the research done by these uh, bots or the artificial intelligence platforms are currently exempted. This is uh, as we derive from this act, but uh, no, so I think this is it for currently for artificial intelligence from my side. Perfect. I think that's all questions that uh, we have on the board. So then I perhaps just take this moment to give the vote of thanks uh, to you, Divya, for taking out time for doing this session. Uh, as I said, we've got an India-Pakistan match going on. In spite yes. of that, you've attended it and a lot of our other uh, uh, participants also. A big thank you to all of you. Uh, just a small request to our participants. If you can please take uh, some time and fill in the survey uh, in the link below, which will be a feedback for uh, you know the kind of training uh, that, that is provided by India. And in addition to this, if you have any further questions on the topic, please feel free to get in touch with the IIA and uh, we'll pass on the questions to Divya and hopefully uh, she can get back to you with an answer. I'll definitely love to. Great. With that, uh, I'd like to call this uh, webinar to an end. Thank you, everyone. Please have a great day and take care. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye -bye.